Hi. Um, it's good to see a lot of people here. I know it's a small room, but it's nice to see lots of people. Um, hi, I'm Amelia. I'm Mealy on Drupal.org and Mealy Jane on Twitter. Um, I used to be lead developer at a company called Godel. We were a web agency based in Melbourne, but now I work at Equim um, and I'm specializing in front end development there. Um, we're one of the biggest and most exciting Drupal projects in Melbourne. Um, we're Equim AU on Twitter. What we do is we make an awesome product that uh, connects communities and precincts around office buildings, co-working hubs, residential precincts, and the product allows like all this um, convenience, amenity, and management tools. So for um, there's like a shopping, there's an e-commerce side, there's building management tools, and there's all this other really cool stuff. So I work with them doing the front end of that, um, and I work really closely with designers um, in planning UX and um, doing a lot of really fun stuff. I've been working with Drupal for about four years or so, and I've worked on lots of different theme systems and made lots of different cool things, from very big e-commerce sites to small, crazy, experimental JavaScript fashion sites and cutting edge theme stuff, and also really old school IE8 compatible theme stuff. So that's who I am. And this is um, about this talk. So it's called Red Flags. Um, it's a resource for web designers, front end themers, but also project managers. Um, it's gonna, the, the point is that this talk is about the, the relationship between all these people in doing responsive web development. Um, and I'm gonna identify some red flags, some things to watch out for in the course of that project. Every time I flag something, you'll see a flag. So if you're taking notes and looking down for things to talk to your team about, you can take those down. So show of hands, who's a developer here? Do we have any designers? Some designers? Do we have any project managers? And who's, who's working with responsive websites? It must be pretty much everyone. Cool. We all want to work mobile first, but you can't always get what you want. We all know that this is like the dream, that we want to like have these mobile first designs, these mobile first builds, it's going to be so beautiful and so easy, but it's just not always the way that it goes. And that's the reason why this talk exists, because we don't always end up with this like very simple mobile first process. And you know, responsive design is web design, taking this from Yump who gave a talk about this. But we're looking like every year more and more people are using their mobile devices to access, to access the web. Welcome to everyone who is coming in. <laughs> um, and we know that now when you talk to a client about a site, you're not, it's not optional that you do a responsive design, it's pretty much mandatory. So this is not like, this is a shift that's happened in the last few years and it's something that I think we're all gonna have to start doing really properly and really plan for and all get really good at. Um, so instead of working mobile first, what do we end up with? Sometimes a desktop design and a developer's choice of modern responsive theme with instructions from the designer to just see what works. Um, often we get designs that are intended to be pixel perfect for one particular state of the website or browser or device, but just indicative only for everything else. Or three, th or maybe zero, breakpoint designs with no design instructions for the fluid bits in between, which is a red flag. It's sad. It's really sad for developers, it's sad for clients, it's sad for projects that's been out of control. But actually, like, maybe that's really reasonable, right? Designers can't be expected to, be, to provide pixel-perfect designs for every possible permutation. I mean, this is true to an extent, right? As always, though, the devil is in the details. It's, you know, you can't, you can't make a designer make you a website. There's too much to ask for. But what we're talking is, how can we get it closer to something that a developer can actually use? A surprising amount of design decisions end up in the hands of the developers, red flag. But it doesn't actually end up saving that much time for the project overall. Like, is that really where the decisions should be ma being made or should they be made sort of earlier on in the piece? And this can result in the whole thing getting way more expensive, way, taking way too long. These iterations are gonna happen at some point. So what we're talking about is like, where are these iterations best? Like, where are we gonna do them? Are they gonna be at the start of the project? Are they gonna be at the end of the project at the review? Are they gonna be like interspersed in between? And our designers are trying their hardest, but you know maybe they don't have the right tools for the job. Maybe they're still using Photoshop to create plans for something fluid. 
maybe they come from a print background. A lot of designers that I've worked with have come from a print background, and they don't really know how CSS and HTML work, especially in terms of fluid designs. Maybe they just don't understand Drupal, or what parts of it they can change, or maybe they do understand Drupal, but only enough to know like the bits that they think are holding them back. Oh, I can't do this because of all forms look like this in Drupal, or all admin systems look like this in Drupal. It happens a lot. Project managers are trying really hard too, right? Developers might be asked to improvise because the design budget might be restrictive compared to the development budget. So the decisions are given to the developers because that's where the money is. And project managers are strongly tempted to do this because it makes sense for their projects. And the concept of client or stakeholder sign-off for designs is deeply, deeply powerfully entrenched in the minds of many great and successful people in the web industry, as well as pretty much every client ever. Good luck telling a client that you don't want to sign off on their project. And combating this attitude is not something a lone designer can do on their own. Remember that they'll be held accountable to their, for their work as well, right? Designers, even when they're making these big decisions, they are taking responsibility for them. Red flag if they don't feel that, because they should. But wait, wait, wait. What did I just suggest? That client sign-off is a bad idea? Well, yes. But like many things, it depends. But because of what most project manager, designer, and developer teams are doing right now, this is a red flag for responsive design. I think this is a good thing. Let's be clear. I think the, uh, the idea that client sign-off is, is, needs to be talked about is really important. And I think that's because when a client is signing off on something, especially if it's a PDF or a PSD, it's nothing like the website that you're actually going to build. It's a really, really different thing. Um, and I don't think you can sign off on a, P on like a PDF if what you're going to be building is a fluid, responsive website. They're completely different. So I don't think that sign-off means anything. There's two primary hurdles to that design being sign-offable. And clear industry trends mean that these two hurdles are getting bigger and more important every year. Development and design have to be iterative and innovative, which means that one sign-off isn't really going to be sufficient anymore. And allowing for a single waterfall design based on a single wireframing session is counterproductive to both of those goals. And of course, the tools that people are using, especially Adobe Suite, are just like getting further and further away from what we're actually building. So here's an example. A designer using Photoshop needs to represent a page containing some basic rich media like a custom video player. So maybe it's a, it's a video player and it, it needs to not be YouTube or Vimeo. So they've used some basic tools in Photoshop like filters and they've made a translucent overlay that applies like a blur on the underlying content. That seems simple enough in Photoshop. But when the developer gets that, they're like, well, not every browser supports this blur feature, and not every video player is going to look like this on all of the browsers. So this idea that was like really easy for the designer to make in their PSD turns out to be really problematic when it gets to the developer. And the client's already signed off on it, so now we're in a problem. <coughs> Web standards such as CSS and JavaScript plus old Internet Explorer browser versions are really poorly equipped to handle every single thing that can be done in Photoshop. There's no like one-to-one -one comparison of what can be done in Photoshop and what can be done online. And as a result, project managers end up having to do all this work, analyzing every design, seeing what's possible, going over and over and over again, trying to document everything. And the larger the project is, the worse that that becomes. So much time gets spent on doing that. And then, of course, res responsive design just adds this whole other level of problem into that. Like, this video player now also has to work on all screen sizes. There was only one design provided. It just goes on and on. So simple assumptions can end up being even geometric impossibilities. So that's sort of an outline of the problem. So now I'm going to talk about what we can do about it. The first thing I think we can do about it is get designers to do things better. So these are some tips for designers. Number one is use the right tools. Photoshop. <sighs> I'm still, even last year, even this year, I've, been, I've seen designs handed over in Photoshop. It's just not really the right tool anymore. So if you're a designer or if you're working with a designer using Photoshop, you should flag it and offer them a better option. Layers don't really make sense for presenting different pages. They're just not, like Photoshop is a photo editing tool, essentially. The idea of like using it for web design is really outdated now. You either have to export it to a PDF or access it in a Photoshop file. Both are pretty bad hard to use, hard to measure, hard to see how much padding margin, what type of font is being used, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff becomes really problematic. Photoshop is also really expensive, and it causes a lot of double handling, which makes it even more expensive. 
you can't prototype anything in Photoshop. You can't see how anything is going to look online. And it only has a really loose, like, if any, sense of hierarchy. So the DOM structure is really difficult to represent. You can't really say what's in any semantic elements, what's a header, what's a footer. It's all just sort of one big flat image style. InDesign, it's better, but it's still not perfect. We've used, like I've used InDesign a lot. I've worked with designers using InDesign a lot. You can create a style guide in InDesign that works much like CSS. You can actually export paragraph and character styles in InDesign, which is really cool. They actually export to CSS, so you can put it in your site. Um, you can design across multiple layouts. There's like a new option in InDesign where you can put the same page into different screen sizes, which is really cool. You can snap items to a grid, which is really important. You can create master pages, which can represent ubiquitous elements like headers and footers. Um, and you can do this liquid layout thing, which is also really cool. Um, I'll put these slides up later so all of these um, things are made clear, um, the, the URLs. Um, but this is our tool of choice. It's called Webflow. Um, it's, there are other browser-based responsive tools that are new and shiny that are very similar to Webflow, but Webflow is really cool. It's like Dreamweaver but it's like in the browser, it's so much better than Dreamweaver. It's pretty mind blowing what this tool can do. So you can design using actual CSS. You can learn about CSS while you design, but it's like a drag and drop clickable interface with buttons instead of writing code. You can create reusable classes that you can apply to elements. You can prototype basic animations, or you can use their pre-made JavaScript snippets or import your own. There's revision history, so you can go back and forth through time to see your designs over time and you can export it as working HTML5 ready code. Developers also think you're really smart because you give them a really awesome handover package. But if you've never built a website before by hand, there will be a learning curve as this may be the first time they've encountered technical concepts like the DOM. So if you're a designer and you've never even thought about how things happen on the internet, it's gonna be like a little bit of a learning curve, but a good one. This is what Webflow looks like. Um, it's really rad. Um, I'm trying to, I feel like we should have a different view for this. Thing, this slide, yeah, maybe we'll use this instead. I don't know if it'll, no, it won't control from there. Okay, we had some technical issues, we'll have to use this. Um, basically, it's a, there's like um, a panel of buttons on the right, and uh, they're all like positioning, um, overflow, um, all, of, all of basic like block, block level stuff, height, width, and they're all configurable in like fields that you can actually type stuff in, and it makes, the UI happen in front of you, and then you can export it, and it's working code, which is really cool. Designing for Drupal is um, one thing that designers need to, it's a, it's a little bit of a shift. So using Webflow or InDesign or Photoshop is really a question, like wh what you're choosing is really a question of what you're actually designing. I wouldn't tell anyone to use one tool indiscriminately, because if you're designing a holding page, or if you're designing an e-commerce store, if you're designing like a, a feature page, they're all really different. So maybe you need to use a tool that allows you to do certain things. Maybe you need to use a tool that is um, a, lot, a lot simpler. So um, we often use a combination of these tools, depending on what we're doing. Not everything needs to be prototyped. So maybe some things can be done in a style guide. Maybe some things need to be done in Webflow. It's up to you. Um, consider what responsive functionality you actually need to describe for each page that you're designing. And yeah, just use your best judgment. And where possible, look at what Drupal provides you in terms of markup. So if you can, find out the basic elements that Drupal are giving you on this page that you need to design so you can start there. But I'll talk a bit more about that later. Prototyping. Um, prototyping is really cool. I'm a developer, I obviously think that. Um, we live in a world where the web isn't just a static image cut from the page, we can't just like, take a PDF and put it on the internet anymore. Contemporary websites include animations, interactions, even little gradual hover effects and fades. All of that stuff is really important and so important to specify in your design as well. Um, a static design provided to a developer, like in a PDF or a PSD, pretty much never includes any sort of animation spec. Um, it's just overlooked. And then at the end, while the project is being built, those changes start to be made and often can take time because they haven't been specified at the start. So if you're not getting one, you should ask for one. This might sound crazy, but I actually think that designers can learn to prototype as well. And I think it can make designers better at their jobs if they can provide those prototypes to developers. Prototyping is really cool. These are some of the tools that you can use to prototype. Um, 
Envision is a really cool app that um, allows you to have clickable hotspots. Webflow, we've talked about Macora, is similar to Webflow. CodeDrops is a really cool website where you can actually um, see patterns that people have created and look at the code and um, give that to a developer as an example. CodePen is um, another website like that where you can sort of, there's three different panels of coding and then um, for like HTML, CSS, JavaScript and then a result. And so you can see the results of your code. And Simply Test Me is an awesome Drupal site that um, allows you to spin up a Drupal instance and actually look at what it provides you at that time. And so if you're trialing a module or um, someone has offered you a theme that you want to use, you can spin it up and look at what that provides you straight away. So all of those things are completely open to designers. And I think it's really important that designers get involved with that and start prototyping stuff before jumping in. So you don't just like create something that's impossible to actually build, especially in Drupal. That said, designers can provide us some prototypes that sometimes are a bit tr tricky to actually build in reality. And you don't, it's, it's worth talking to a developer before you hand it over. Like, I found this prototype. Is this actually possible? Can we make this? Third thing I think that designers should do is create a style guide. Um, John Album is currently doing a talk on style guide driven development. So if you're really interested in that, you should leave and go to his talk. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a boff later as well, so there's a, we can all get together and talk about it. Um, but say I have rough early designs or wireframes provided, and we look at the content structure and there's a few pages that haven't been designed. This happens all the time, right? What's the best way forward? Should we ask the designer to make more designs and get more client sign-off? Probably not, because that's just going to spin, spin us around in circles. But we've got a better idea, which is to use the style guide. So style guides follow the 80-20 rule. They do 80% of the work in about 20% of the time. They're automatically responsive because once you build the elements, you're building them on element level. You're styling, making styles that can be responsive at the point of the actual element as opposed to the page. And they make the world a happier place. We believe in style guide driven development. Um, and that means that the, the style guide isn't just created for the benefit of developers or for the benefit of designers, it's for everyone. It makes the design process better and it also makes the development process better. Um, so if your designer hasn't heard of a style guide at all, that's probably a red flag. And we think that you should request one for every single site that you're doing. It just, it just means that like, there's all these awesome benefits for style guides. So we originally started doing style guides in InDesign because as we were um, doing these designs, we'd um, set up the paragraph and the character styles at the start of the, the process and then those would create consistency as we themed up elements in InDesign and then when we hand it over to a developer, developer, it's all sort of, it's from a base set of styles as opposed to sort of made up on the spot. Um, and it, that limits like sort of weird new styles being introduced on page four or page five. Um, it speeds up development quite significantly. Basically developers can start by putting the style guide in place, gets typography in place, it gets image styles, um, forms, lists, all that stuff sort of already looking good. Maybe even it will get um, some object level styles, maybe some divs or borders or things like that are happening. So once that's already in place globally, when you go to this page that you haven't themed up before, it's actually like maybe 50% done, just needs a bit of zhuzhing. Hmm? What about it? Oh, okay. Um, we, when I was working with Godel, I created a document called the Style Guide Guide which we would give to designers um, who were like, what is a style guide? How do I make a web style guide? And the style guide guide, which we'll probably, we'll, we'll put it online somewhere, I don't know where it is at the moment, is a list of like, pretty much like a bunch of Drupal elements, like almost everything that you'd need. And it just is like, it's instructions for a designer to design styles for all of these things. So instead of being like, oh, I gave you like styles for all of the typography and then when the developer gets to making a table and has no styles for it, it's actually like a pretty exhaustive list of elements that you need to think about. Um, so it's, that's one thing is that like even the best designers will sometimes forget something like this. Like maybe they've forgotten what a drop down looks like on a form or maybe they've forgotten like what a link looks like in the footer. Just like these little things that as people change content around the site actually need to have patterns ready. So um, we've created a style guide guide, but anyone can create a style guide guide. And it's a really sort of, um, it's something that you can reuse across every project, especially if you're continually working with Drupal. Um, and yeah, the, the great benefit for this is responsive design, really. It, it's just perfect for it because if you have, um, if you've styled an element 
especially if you're using SAS or breakpoint mix-ins, you can actually um, have that, the styles for that element and at a mix-in style guide level so that when that element appears in the wild on a page that you haven't themed up, it already looks right on the different breakpoints, which is really important. Um, this is for designers to get on the grid. Have you ever been, this is a question for developers, have you ever been working on a responsive site and the designers told you that an element is the wrong exact pixel width? Um, red flag if anyone actually tells you that because when we work on the grids, things don't really have exact pixel widths anymore because they can't because otherwise they might spill over the side of the screen when they start adding up together. Getting on the grid is really awesome. If you're a designer and you're not on the grid, does any, are there any designers here who don't know about grid-based designs? Probably everyone knows, but basically um, there's some really cool grid tools out there for developers now, especially one called Singularity Grid System that we work with, which I'll talk about a bit later. But if you're not designing to a grid, and more importantly, if you're not designing to a responsive grid, you should start looking into that because it's gonna increase, it, it'll just make life easier for the developers by a hundredfold. It's, it's so different getting a grid-based design where someone tells you this element is actually three columns as opposed to this element just looks like it's maybe three and a half, maybe three and three quarters columns, and then trying to figure that out. So if you're, if you're using tools that allow you to design to a grid and you're handing over design packages to developers with the grid involved, you are a gem and you should keep doing that. Um, basically, the fluid grid idea allows developers to work with fractions and percentages to position elements and to give them width. And that's pretty much the core of responsive design at the moment. So it's really important. This is a small point for designers, but please stop using the same lorem for every single element. Because it just, it never happens that these elements are ever the same size. It might seem like a small point, but it's actually a really big point. Um, it's never ever the same case. And a developer can demonstrate this to you very, very quickly by firing up the develop module, which will give you many, many different text bits for all of the different elements. And they won't look like this. In fact, they'll actually look like this. And when that screen gets smaller, you can imagine how much worse that that looks. And it's a red flag because if you ever see that in a design or if you ever do that in a design, you should rethink it immediately. Section two about developers. These are tips for developers to do things better with their responsive designs. The first tip is the most important, is to ask questions and analyze. It's so, so important. It's like basically the whole part of this talk is that if you see one of these red flags, do something about it. Don't just notice it, have your heart sink, and then think about all the terrible times that you're gonna go through when you get up to making that bit. It's the worst thing to do. It's really, really important that you set aside actual time to analyze the designs, flag the things that aren't gonna work, and and, and do something about it. And that means you need to make sure your project manager or project lead is aware that you're gonna need time to do that as well. You need to annotate designs wherever possible. A tool like InVision is really good for this. Google Docs works as well. And you need to be constructive. So don't just say, that's not gonna work. I'm not gonna build that. That's terrible. You need to work constructively to actually offer solutions of how things are gonna work over responsive breakpoints. So if you see something that is problematic, you should have the knowledge or try to do the research to figure out a way that it's gonna work because the designer can't always do that. Don't be judgy. You're annotating it to point out red flags, not to judge it if you like it or not. And keep your tech stack in mind. So always consider what base theme, what grid system, and what Drupal provides. Um, so you can actually offer solutions that will work with what you actually build in the future. This leads into learning best practice Drupal and responsive web technologies and recommending them. It's your responsibility to keep up. These are like five points, but there's probably five million out there because as we all know, like re responsive web technologies are changing literally every day. But these are some that I think would be useful for developers to recommend to designers. SVGs and icon fonts. So if you've got a design that has lots of little icons in it and they're getting sent to you in a package of PNGs, maybe think about asking for those to be provided to you in SVGs so you can create an icon font implement them in a way that's gonna work with retina devices. Also retina ready images. If someone sends you a design with a full screen background image or a full width banner image, you need to tell that designer that that image probably needs to be twice the width that they've actually provided it in and make sure that the client's okay with that if they're gonna be actually uploading those images. Um, singularity grid system, which I've mentioned briefly, but it's an amazing grid system where you can um, set 
an arbitrary amount of grids for any element on a website, and then you can put grids inside of elements on a website. So you can have a base grid of 12 columns, and then when a designer gives you a menu with five items, you can set um, another grid inside your header with 10 columns, and then like onwards into infinity. So whatever sort of option is given to you in terms of fractions, you can keep doing that. There's lots of other grid systems out there, but it's my favorite. Um, responsive video approaches, something that goes on all the time. How is my video gonna look on mobile, on iPad, on whatever? FitVids is a really awesome library that allows um, embedded videos to scale according to screen size. <laughs> and full screen background images, very fashionable at the moment. Everyone likes them, they look beautiful. Everyone struggles to find great assets for them, but they're nice. Um, Backstretch is a really cool library that takes a lot of hassle out of implementing that. Um, so that's a, a small selection of non-Drupal ones. But here are some awesome Drupal tools. Um, base themes, uh, obviously, probably the most important thing when you're choosing your tech stack in terms of front-end theming. We use Aurora, which is like a beautiful, minimalist, simple base theme basically comes with pretty much nothing prescribed and allows you to use its um, sort of the things that it likes, like Singularity, Modernizer, and SAS. Um, and Omega 4, which is really similar, also uses those technologies, but it gives you a bit more to work with. So if you wanted to provide um, a base theme to your um, designer, that would be a good one to go with. But um, we use Aurora because what we'd, our designs are super custom. They don't really represent anything we've ever seen in a base theme, so it works best for us. We did, can start from scratch. Um, but, I mean, there's lots of themes out there. These are the two that I found the best for um, responsive, responsive design. Third thing for developers is remember that all browsers just can't responsive. This is really important, and it means that you need to make sure that everyone is aware that your responsive behaviors, fluid screens, and other fancy things just won't happen in Internet Explorer 8. You'd be surprised how often this comes up which is good because people don't use IE8 on their phones <laughs> um, yet. <laughs> but this is important. Like, it happens all the time that we get to the point that um, we're looking at in the old browser. Why does it do the same thing? And it, because it doesn't need to. So the last part of the talk is red flags in the wild. So I'm going to identify some patterns um, that you might have seen, you might be currently using, um, you might be thinking about using they're not very complicated, but it's sort of to give you an idea of the thing that I'm talking about. So number one is teasers with images. This is a common summary style. You see it everywhere. It's got a red flag because it is problematic. It's a bit of a nope for me. Every time I see it, I'm like, ugh, so many problems. <laughs> Want to keep the height the same on both sides with the responsive thing? We get some problems with our image getting squished and more squished and then really squish, and you can't even see my sushi cat's face. Um, but the more lines that you have means the left-hand section gets taller, which makes the right-hand section taller and skinnier. As you can imagine, it gets worse and worse. Why don't you just keep the image a square, Amelia? Um, <laughs> it's a good idea. I mean, the sushi cat's a square. It'll work. It's working so far, right? But when we get to this point where this left-hand side's like this tall, it's the same size as when we started. <laughs> um, so, you know, what I'm saying is that this requires planning. It, and it requires planning when you're thinking about what happens in those in-between points between your breakpoints. The best solution that we found to this is keeping the text really short. If you can't force someone to write short text, like if you can't put a character limit on, think about using text overflow ellipsis or read more button, which you can get at this dot, dot, dot um, library, which is really cool. Make the text a lot shorter than you think you're going to need. Because remember, as that scheme, that the screen gets smaller, the text splits over multiple lines and just grows and grows. Also consider that the content of the image will inform the decision about how to ha handle it responsibly. And this is one thing that like, always gets missed in this process, is that we're thinking about what, what is this image actually going to be? Like, is this an image that I can squish? Is it someone's face? <laughs> is it someone's body? Do I want to, like, what can I, or is it just an abstract? It's like a tree or something that it's maybe okay. Think about what the design intention is. If you're a developer, you need to ask about, like, what the design intention here. Does this image always have to be four by six? Does it always have to be portrait? Does it always have to be landscape? People forget to ask these questions, and then when you've decided to implement it and you get to it, and the designer looks at it and he says, well, when I make the screen this big, it's not right. It's sort of this thing that we need to talk about right at the start when you see this pattern. Some designs won't suit user square. 
they just won't. And manual crop module is something that I'll be mentioning over and over in this section, but it's a really, really clever module that allows you to upload an image like on a node and choose different croppings for that image. So I can upload a simple image and crop it landscape and crop it portrait, and then I can display those crops on different parts of the site using views or display suite or whatever. So it's really clever. Next one is this menu pattern, which you'll see everywhere. It's fixed, probably. Doesn't really matter. Um, it's hard to do, and you feel like this sometimes when you're making it for the amount of times that you have to change it. Because what are you going to do when this happens? <laughs> this is actually a problem, especially when the client's able to change the amount of menu items. So if you're making a menu like this, definitely clarify whether those menu items are going to be changed or whether they're fixed, because they're likely going to be changed. It's pretty much always going to be changed. Solution is pretty simple, right? Um, maybe at this point we take off the borders. At this point, the logo disappears and we've just got a little icon. Drupal 8's navigation menu does a bit of this until it hits the mobile breakpoint. Except even when you're doing that, when someone's adding more menu items, it gets out of control because you've, you've targeted those patterns to come in at different breakpoints based on the amount of menu items you had at the start. So red flag if you see that. Best solution that we found is also to switch to that mobile style hamburger menu as soon as is humanly possible. Like maybe when you get to 960 pixels, make it a hamburger. People are starting to get used to this idea that this mobile style menu will appear on desktop screens and it really fixes problems like this quite well. Number three, image ratios. Probably the most common thing that we've ever found with this developer, designer, client sort of triangle is people not really understanding how image ratios work or how the same image can work in different ratios across the site. Using the same image for a thumbnail and a hero image always seems like such a great idea in the design, doesn't it? Except it could just go so wrong. Suddenly we've got someone with half a head and it happens over and over again. Same goes for full screen background images. Looks great on mobile, we decapitated her on desktop. Especially if that image is user uploaded. You have no idea what someone's gonna put in there or whether it's gonna look right. This actually happened to us. It was a fashion website. The design had a banner image and every image they uploaded was an image of catwalk models, which is just obviously not gonna work in this landscape thing. This is what I mean about talking about what the content of images are going to be before you start designing them. And if that hasn't been talked about and maybe the developer needs to mention it, then they should mention it too. So get some representative actual content when you're designing. Like talk to the client about, give me some examples of images you're actually going to put in the site. Um, it might take time, but if you find that someone's uploading catwalk images into their banners, it's probably not going to be great. Um, you could also, the developers could actually allow the users to choose their croppings using the manual, modu manual crop module, which is really awesome. Um, or just use abstract imagery with no faces. I can't really tell anyone to do that because they're just going to upload whatever they want. Um, or provide an image guide with your site and hope for the best. I wouldn't really recommend that. Number four, grids with images and text, or even just with text. This might look familiar. We've talked about it before. It's because it's very problematic. Every time it happens, we need to talk about how is this grid going to work? How do you want them to be masonry? Do you want them to work on responsive screens? Maybe we want them to like tile together in this like brickwork way. Not always, right? I want to introduce this solution because we found it and we thought it was really awesome, where each of these blocks ends up being the same size like across a row, like irrelevant of what content is inside of it. It's called match height. It's what make de it makes developers very happy. So across this, this, these three, on each column, on each row, on each row, it's um, using JavaScript to calculate the height of the tallest item and make all of the things in the row the same height. So it looks pretty, and it's a really easy way to solve this grid problem. Here's another one. Image teasers with hovers. These are all articles about sushi cats which is awesome, because when I hover over it, I can tell with my mouse that it says sushi cats. Easy, right? <sighs> no. <laughs> <clears throat> Everyone forgets that you can't hover on a touch screen, right? So if you see this pattern in your desktop design and you're a developer, you need to make sure that you tell someone that you can't hover on a mobile and you need a different pattern for mobile. 
And also, every time the screen gets smaller, these titles can sometimes start spilling over or not working anymore. So you need to make sure you let your designer or maybe even your client know that the titles in the boxes need a character limit, unless you've got a budget to look into scaling text, which we still haven't had, so maybe one day, but um, it's never really the solution that we go for. Um, and that you need to let them know that there'll be some sort of non-hover-based pattern to use on mobile devices, and you need to ask about it. Number six, how do you solve a problem like an e-commerce menu? <laughs> this is a typical menu on an e-commerce store, right? Men's, women's, contact. On desktop, it's pretty simple. We can hover over men's, and then we see the men's subcategories. And if we click the men's top-level na nav item, we go to the men's overview. If we click shirts, we just see shirts. It's pretty normal, right? When we get to mobile, suddenly we need this like two-way navigation thing where we've got men's, and then when we click on men's, it takes us to the men's subcategories. And then we can't see the men's overview anymore because we're in the subcategories. So how do we get back to the, the overview one? So we need this one that goes back and forth. So maybe when you click men's, when you tap men's, it takes you to the men's overview, and you tap this arrow, it opens the submenu. But when we drill down to that submenu, we have to put this like all men's item back in. So we've created a new menu item that we have to add into our submenu that wasn't there before on the desktop one. We only had shirts as with shirts, shorts, jumpers, and accessories. So we, when we get to here, we need this all men's item, which is new. So that means, and like this might seem like trivial in the design, but for a developer, that means we need a different menu. It's actually a different set of markup that we're using now. So what you need to consider is, should you actually be showing the same menu on desktop and mobile? Like maybe you need an actual different block of, of markup to be using. And maybe you should be switching between that block and the actual menu that you were using on desktop with, with your SAS or with your context or whatever module you're using to do this. Maybe you need the client's input at this stage. Are you okay with us using a different menu on mobile? Is that, does that make sense? Um, and think about how your choice of, choice of mobile menu and how you design that mobile menu is actually going to like, affect the user's ability to navigate the site. Like, have you made a mobile menu that means users can't access the overview page anymore, which is going to be problematic. Number seven, quickly, is maps. How do we get our desktop map to be a mobile map? One in, maybe this one is just in a block and this is full screen. If your developer designer sent you an image of a map, maybe that's a red flag because um, there's better solutions out there. And you might want to introduce them to Leaflet, which is a mobile-friendly, touch-optimized, amazing, resizable, flexible map library and super easy to use. And if you see Rick DeBoer, he will tell you all about it because he loves it and he talks about it all the time. So the summary for this talk is for designers, you need to use the right tools, prototype, and be open to feedback from developers. Create style guides and design to a fluid grid. For develop developers, ask lots of questions and properly analyze designs when they're given to you. Keep an eye out for common problems that impact dynamic layouts. Offer solutions based on your tech stack. Use the right tools and choose a good base theme. And get acquainted with responsive tools that Drupal offers and other non-Drupal tools. And for everyone, developers and designers, use this list and create your own list of red flags to watch out for so you can identify them in designs and immediately mention that it might be problematic for fluid designs. I'll put these slides up online, but here's a list of pretty much everything I mentioned. These are all the Drupal modules that we've talked about. Um, and these are all the cool design tools that we've talked about. If you guys, I, will, I can go back and let you take photos of these if you're taking photos of them. <laughs> these are the tools for responsive designs. And this is the other libraries and resources that we really love for responsive web development. Um, that's the end. Uh, there's a little bit of time if you have any questions. Uh, yeah? Um, no, it's a small room, it's fine. Just the, the manual prop module, I um, wasn't actually aware of that one, but there's a couple of other modules that we use to do a similar kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which basically just allows you to select an area and say, you never cross this area. Yeah. Yeah. Basically allows you to select a point to be the centre of any crop. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any opinions about those three comparisons. So the the other two that you mentioned are really cool. They um they sort of uh, there's almost a bit more like magic going on behind the scenes. You choose the bit that you like, and then the computer decides what it displays. Um, we found that even when we've done that. 
the crops that come out of the wash are not really right for clients. They're like, oh, I chose this bit, but actually it's still not quite right. Manual crop literally allows the client to choose exactly the crop that they want. So for someone who wants more fine-grained um, control over the actual look and feel of their website, it seems to work better. Um, it's nice to use as well. I mean, they're all nice to use, but yeah, that's been our preference. Um, well, I think especially with a homepage, I encourage designers to try and provide an actual design of it. Um, but the style guide is almost like a mandatory thing it, that you provide alongside your designs. Um, I probably wouldn't ever trust a developer to make something like a homepage based on a style guide. Um, just because it's such, you're right, it's like a big reveal. It's a really important thing for a client. So it's sort of about getting your designers to design up the key, really important bits of the website and choose which ones don't actually need full designs. Like maybe your contact page doesn't need a full design. Maybe um, like the node page for something really simple like a, a reference or something doesn't need a design. Maybe that can be done by a developer using the style guide. But they should, and it's almost like doing like a Moscow style, um, like, uh, comparison of what is and isn't important. Get the client to be like, I want designs for this page, this page, this page, but these ones I don't really care about. Cool. Hi, Josh. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I'm not, might be Macau. I don't think Webflow does that. Webflow allows you to sort of bring up the grid as an overlay on what you're designing. Um, but there's, there was a tool that I put in the references that I didn't end up talking about, which is really good for if you've been given a design without a grid, you can overlay your own grid in the browser. So you can upload that design into the browser and overlay your own grid on it and try to figure out where the grid was. Correct. Yeah. So we do like a bit of, um, a, I mean, we haven't fully like rolled this process out, but the idea is that you'll get your export from Webflow, which will be CSS, like nice CSS. They pride themselves on the good CSS that they produce, but then turning those into mixins um, and making them nested and doing whatever you need to do to make it SaaS. Um, and yeah, and then I, I think, especially with the grid, because the grids can be so complex like with designs as they're coming up, that it's almost best that you don't get that provided to you by a program. Like it often like requires a bit of developer magic to make it work. So um, yeah, but I mean, even at that point, if you've been given a whole export of CSS that really works, even turning that into SAS is still faster than writing it yourself.